Hello, this is Jim Vieira. Uh, thanks for having me back at Origins. And today I was going to talk about uh, the new book that Hugh and I just came out with, and the launch is occurring during this conference. So let me share my screen here. Uh, today I'll be talking about the lost lands and the ancient gods of Ireland and Scotland. Uh, Hugh and I have been working on this new book for several years, and a lot of themes came out of our research, a lot of interesting themes. It's not just about a, a collation of documentation in the historical record. It's also about written and oral traditions and uh, esoteric sources and kind of a, a different way to look at the past. Um, one that is uh, not always accepted by, you know, rigorous academic approaches, but one that is uh, understood to be a, a holistic approach to the past. So bearing that in mind, if you've seen my talks before, I, I like to uh, bring in different sources and have the audience make up their mind about uh, the mysteries that I present. Um, my brother and I have been hosts for several uh, History Channel shows, and Hugh has been on the Search for the Lost Giants show that we did. Hugh and I have written several books, uh, Giants on Record, about the story of um, the giant lore, mythology, and historical documentation in the United States. And now our newest book, The Giants of Stonehenge in Ancient Britain. Um, I'd, I'd like to uh, share some recent finds. I guess uh, there's a lot of research in what you would call the alternative research hemisphere. And uh, some of the speakers you'll hear in this conference, Andrew Collins, Greg Little, Hugh and I, have been talking about these um, controversial subjects for many years and almost predicting that science would verify them. Actually, Greg Little is the one who got me into ancient mysteries with his wonderful mound builder books. And Greg has, has been pounding the, the table on the idea that the Clovis barrier was, uh, was fraudulent, if you will, the idea that um, um, humans came over to North America, you know, 11, 12,000 years ago. And now we have new incontrovertible proof that humans were in North America much earlier than first thought. And a, a new scientific study just came out where these footprints in New Mexico were found embedded with the grass seeds. So unequivocal, as you'll see, is, is the uh, adjective that was used. Now, research studying fossilized human footprints in New Mexico said that they have the first unequivocal evidence that humans were in North America at least 23,000 years ago. Now, all of this, all this new science kind of it fuels this idea of a kind of um, a lost world, if you will, that we'll talk about, you know, a world of um, with, with myth meets science, where the mythological is understood to have some basis in reality. And, and that's where I gear a lot of my research to. It, it strikes me intuitively correctly, and I try to verify it with science. Uh, and we all know about Gobekli Tepe, the 12,000-year-old temple site. But new finds in Karahan Tepe that Hugh has investigated for years, and they've been digging there for several years. And actually, Turkish archaeologists say that they might have found 12 new Gobekli Tepes. So it's like the most massive megalithic complex in human history, but it's the oldest. Uh, it's stunning, astonishing. You run out of uh, descriptive words for it. And it's a total curveball to the idea of, um, you know, origins. Uh, the, the way the orthodox archaeologists talk about them. And, and I'll say I'm not an anti-science by any means. I work with anthropologists and archaeologists and historians. On all my shows, we have a team of experts and skeptics, and we debate these things. And in order to prove your case, you must uh, use science to validate it. I am not, once again, anti-science by any means, but I believe that science doesn't embrace um, oral traditions, religious documents, sometimes esoteric sources to try to point in the right direction and figure out these mysteries. I'll show that I indeed do that with genetics and, and other science in my talk here and in my research. And I'll, I'll show where uh, myth meets legend uh, and science um, across the board. So this is a Denise of Moeller, as Greg and Andrew will talk about, I'm sure. And Hugh and I talked about this in our book. And the Denisovans are this human cousin that mated with us and Neanderthals about 40,000 years ago. This, the first remains were found. Now, the teeth are huge. And basically, we all predicted, and we even talked about this in our show, that when evidence is found, like a skull, it will end up being massive. Now, 
this new skull was just found in in China. Um, it was actually found in 1938, and it was sent to the University of Beijing and called Homo Longi. Uh, the thought is that Japanese anthropologists believe that it's a new human ancestor. I don't really believe that. I think it's Denisovan. I think Greg and Andrew and Hugh agree with that. Um, and Chris Stringer, also one of the most respected anthropologists, uh, also believes that. So the moral to the story here is it's the largest homo skull ever found. And it is pointing more and more to the evidence that Denisovans were utterly huge. Uh, we don't have the long bones yet. You know, it could be eight, nine foot tall on average. We don't know, but this is more corroborative proof of that. So it's the largest homo skull ever found. Chris Stringer said, this is the biggest human skull I've ever seen, and I've seen a few. So for me, I got into this whole vein of research just reading through town and county histories because I'm a stonemason who likes to historically date um, stone structures and to pose the hypothesis that Native Americans built with stone in, in New England, where I live here in the United States. But I'm going to go back and forth with some of the old book and a lot of the new just to show you these parallels from across the ocean and, and how remarkable they are. So the first account I ever ran into was by this man, George Sheldon, amateur archaeologist, head of um, the department at uh, Deerfield University, a former Massachusetts state senator. He uncovered in his town history, he shows this, uh, one, one of these skeletons was described to me by Henry Mather, who saw it as being of monstrous size, the head as big as a peck basket with double teeth all around. This was examined by Stephen Williams, who said the owner must have been nearly eight feet high. So I was kind of awestruck when I first saw this. Stephen Williams taught anatomy at Berkshire College and was from a lineage of, of uh, doctors as well. So this is no amateur checking it out. And then I looked at other town and county histories around New England, found the same thing. In Middleborough, seven foot eight, and uh, there was the skull was found to have a double row of teeth in each jaw. So that that's the thing I'm hitting here, this double rows of teeth and massive jaw bones. And then you go over the town of Rockingham. This is interesting because the native chief that the skeleton belonged to was known in historical times to be massively tall, of uh, incredible strength, and had a double set of teeth. And when he was found, when they dug up the railroad, his native brethren tried to hide him from um, and, and, and set him aside uh, in, in a sacred burial spot. But when they dug the uh, railroad trench uh, in Rockingham, they unearthed his skeleton. So the jawbone was, was of such size that it fit over the, the face, slipped easily over the face, and his teeth, which would double, were perfect. So Hugh and I in the show, we dug through the records, we found Lyman Simpson Hayes's uh, archaeological reports who wrote the town history of Rockingham. And right here in the middle, you see, he goes out of his way to say all the teeth would double, double row of teeth. And this is all around the country. In Minnesota, the gigantic human beings, um, double teeth in front as well as in the back part of the jaw, very specifically laying out this uh, dental anomaly. And here is the Bates Mound in Ohio. Look at how specific this is. The skeleton is eight feet. The remarkable feature of these remains, they all had double teeth in front as well as in the back and both the upper and lower jaws. Excuse me. Upon exposure to the atmosphere, the skeleton soon crumbled back to earth. Now, the Smithsonian accounts and, and many um, archaeological records indicate that many of these um, remains, after they were measured by scientists and archaeologists, oftentimes would uh, crumble back to earth because uh, something when they react to the atmosphere or something like that. But it is in the record. It's uh, written by the Smithsonian scientists. And in fact, I did a, a TEDx talk. It was the number one watched TEDx talk in the world at the time. And I just went through this case right here and got taken down off the internet, considered anti-scientific, where I wasn't even making a case. I was just laying out these accounts and saying, wow, isn't this fascinating? Look at this information that's beyond coincidence, buried in obscure journals in a time of inefficient communication. That's basically the only case I made. But I saw how kind of reactive and infantile um, the ego is and, and academics can be. Now, the alternative side is also has many hucksters and snake oilers and bullshit artists. So I like to meet in the middle and work with people who aren't uh, um, paralyzed in, the, in their views or polarized, I should say. So anyways, 
well, let me get over to the Scientific American, all the way in California, Catalina Island, same thing. They were furnished with double teeth all around the jaw. So Chris Kroom, Coombs, the Giants of Wales, he wrote, he was an academic from uh, um, North Texas State, uh, a wonderful uh, academic and author. I spoke with him. He passed away recently. Uh, he was a great inspiration for this book. It was tough to to get him to open up to why he wrote the Giants, Giant of Wales, the Giants of Wales, but he just seemed enthralled with the subject. And he went through the historical record as a sober academic and just laid out this kind of case for the uh, entanglement of giant lore into the landscape and mythology and academic record of Wales. So within it, though, he has this interesting, um, this is 200 AD, this interesting account when Hadrian the Emperor, Emperor uh, raised from the earth in a place called Messina, that's Carthage, the body of the giant called Ida it was 20 feet in length and it had double sets of teeth or two rows of teeth still standing completely preserved in his head or in his gums. Now, this is a 2000 year old account. I know you're saying like 20 feet long. Uh, it, that is so wild. It's beyond belief. But what I'm pointing to is that this idea of double rows of teeth is associated with this ancient 2000 year old account of, of a giant that was on earth. Uh, just, just really stunning. And you go over to um, the Canary islands and you have this account um, from Pritchard in 1855, they measured a 15 foot in length skeleton and the skull contained 80 teeth and the hair and breast of others were covered with hair. So another, uh, place with this weird dentition anomaly. And in this ties into the uh, the Irish accounts that I'll dive into here, because the destruction of the Durga's hostel, it's an Irish tale belonging to the Ulster cycle of mythology. Uh, and check out what it says. Not one of the Fomorians was found to fight him. The Fomorians destroy neither corn nor milk in Erin beyond their fair tribute. Well, may their aspect be low thee three rows of teeth in their heads from one ear to another. This, this extra set of teeth is once again associated with this mythological race and this giant race. The Fomorians came over with the giant leader, Baylor, and they were portrayed as a zoological nightmare with all kind of hybrid creatures and giants. And it sounds like a, a Tolkien mystery book, but uh, that is the way it's portrayed in the, in these documents. Robert Temple, um, wrote about this this dental anomaly in uh, the series mystery as well. And this is what he says. Growing a third set of teeth in ancient times was meant to be a sign of a supernatural hero. So perhaps there is a very rare genetic syndrome where a man of an abnormal size and strength with a third set of teeth occurs in the population. Now, Gilgamesh and Hercules and John Leonard were all historical figures who had extra rows of teeth. John Leonard and his brothers were personal bodyguards to George Washington. And Leonard was known to have incredible strength and his brothers to be, um, you know, of titanic size and have extra sets of teeth. So it's, it's strung about through all these sources, this really specific anomaly that uh, it seems beyond coincidence that you find it in so many places, including the Babylonian Talmud. Uh, a truly amazing cor corroboration of the dentition of these antediluvian giants is found in the Hulan section of the Barak Thoth of the Babylonian Talmud, where it was said the giants before the deluge had numerous sets of teeth. I'd like to point to uh, Angus McCaskill. We write about him in our Scottish chapter. He's called the Scottish giant. He moved to Nova Scotia. Here he is next to a six foot five friend, uh, so that shows uh, what a towering presence he had. And the distinction of his status as a true giant hinges on the fact that Angus was purported to be free of any growth abnormalities. His stature was proportional in every way, and his immense size and strength was due only to his natural genetic gifts. Now, the case you and I make in the book is that there seems to be some genetic link with certain people who were born through you know, some giant lineage of the past. And... These aren't people with pituitary gigantism who grow out of control and die when they're 22 and can't walk without a cane and have a, a tumor on the pituitary gland. That's a different thing. This is a normal person in all ways who is absolutely uh, huge but has Herculean strength. Um, here are some, some of his stats. Seven foot ten, 
he weighed an astonishing 580 pounds. His shoulders were 44 inches wide and the palm of his hands, eight inches wide, 12, 13 and a half, 18 inches in circumference. You see it all. His, his almost supernatural strength was well documented. Now here is his hand with those statistics, his handprint at the museum. It's, it's ridiculous basically. So this is what gets me. Um, he lifted a ship's anchor that weighed 2,800 pounds to chest height, excuse me, and had the ability to carry barrels weighing over 350 pounds a piece on each arm. So I, I'm a former decathlete and um, I've lifted millions of pounds in my life. I, in fact, herniated a disc trying to pick up the end of a thousand pound stone uh, that we were placing in. So I know about heavy weights and lifting them. And his, his attributes of strength are, uh, are ridiculous and mind numbing and to lift 2,800 pounds, um, is so well beyond, um, normal that, that it's, um, it grabs your attention. Uh, I'll leave it at that, but it, I'm just awestruck by his skill set and the fact that he was, you know, basically had no abnormalities as well. So in the annual report of the Smithsonian, uh, Augustus Mitchell, Mitchell, this doctor, he finds an over seven foot skeleton with a giant skull. And he writes that the bisection of some of these teeth show the dental nerve to be protected by unusual thickness on the surface of the crown. And some of the set and some, the second set was observed while one jaw had evidence of an even third set of teeth. So Smithsonian uh, scientists also documented on several occasions, this idea of extra rows of teeth along with enormous skeletons. There's over 20 accounts of seven and eight foot tall skeletons in the Smithsonian record. And somebody might ask, well, that's not a giant. And uh, Greg and Andrew approach the subject in their book as well, that there are so many accounts of well over seven and eight foot tall uh, skeletons in the burial mounds that were found in the United States, that it's, it's uh, of such a higher proportion than the normal population, that it is an in uh, an anthropological mystery, no question about it. And I'm talking about Smithsonian documents, the head of ethnology at the Smithsonian finding a giant skeleton, the head of the anthropology department at the Carnegie finding an eight and a half foot skeleton, uh, a University of Alabama archaeologist in 1965 at DeSoto Cave finding an over seven foot skeleton with a jawbone so large it fit over his face. Uh, you know, Don Dragoo and, and uh, Webb and Snow, anthropologists in the 50s and um, finding over seven foot skeletons. The moral of the story is there are many of these accounts, including this one from a Smithsonian uh, archaeologist in 1873. The skulls are very large, but fall to pieces on being exposed to the air. One skull was found that measured 36 inches in circumference. That is utterly ridiculous. That is probably belongs to a nine foot tall human. And it was found by a Smithsonian um, scientist. And people ask, where's all the evidence? Uh, definitely some, um, you know, what was on display, was written about. Sometimes the scientists would find the, the skeletons and they would fall to pieces after they measured them and documented them, unfortunately though. So we'll hop over to Ireland and uh, this is a really interesting account because it's from 1950 and it's led by a team of archaeologists it's in the uh universe it's in the up and the ap and it's uh at four Knox, a very known a well-known megalithic site so let's check out the account here ancient bear this is there was a few iterations of this account at the time in 50 and 51. So Irish archaeologists have unearthed traces of a bygone race of supermen. In a prehistoric burial chamber dated to 2000 BC, they found human skeletons which tower head and shoulders over modern man. Many are around seven feet in height of extra, extraordinary width of shoulder and massive bone construction. In the yellow pages of Irish folklore and mythology, seven foot giants stroll gloriously through a land of milk and honey. That is certainly true. The uh, myths and legends of the British Isles are, are rife with uh, giant accounts, giant associations with megaliths, a megalithic science that Hugh will talk about uh, as well in this conference. But right here kind of highlights what I was saying. We're talking about uh, extraordinary and massive bone construction where uh, jaw bones that are huge that fit over the face, giant skulls, thick skulls, well-proportioned, 
like a seven foot seven NFL linebacker who could, you know, just, just pick up 2000, 3000 pound boulders or something like that. Now I'm not saying that that means that giants built the megalithic sites. I'm saying that there just seems to be a genetic link to giant people and they are associated with, with these sites as well. So here's four knocks right here. Here's a human taking photos inside the chamber. Uh, now I'll go over to Ireland to show a really interesting account as well, because I'm, I'm going to show how the jawbone over the face is everywhere in the British Isles and the historical record, just like in the United States. Now I spoke to a friend of mine who's a skeptic and an anthropologist, and he has no, he just can't um, figure out what it really means. Cause he says, if you can fit the jawbone over your face, it is just indicating an enormously large skeleton. And, you know, you, you view this, um, you know, through this lens of, of, of trying to make sense of it. And you think of all these reasons, oh, it should, this could be the cause and that could be the cause. But at the end of the day, something like that, you can't get around. The jawbone is over the face. The accounts are from burial mounds. They're with Native American artifacts in the U.S. and oftentimes with swords or Neolithic artifacts. These are human tombs with human skeletons. They're not mastodon bones like some pseudo-skeptics like to talk about. These are human remains. Whatever you think about it, they are written down by respected individuals, and uh, they are describing the same anatomic anomalies that are beyond coincidence. So in the popular tales of the Highlands, John Francis Campbell writes, there was a place in Glen Elg called the Tall or Big Man's Ridge. Traditions say that two of the uh, Fingalians were drowned whilst cr crossing, and they returned there. The bones were found when they dug it up to be quite fresh and of extraordinary size. In fact, it was nine and 11 foot tall uh, in the other account, these two skeletons. No person ever saw anything to compare with them before, and it is said no person could, could at all credit or even imagine the size of them, but those who saw them. One gentleman who was present, the late excellent Reverend MacGyver, and father of the much respected present minister of Sky, stood six feet two inches in high and very stout in proportion. <clears throat> Everyone was wonderstruck at the immensity of the bones. He took the lower jawbone and easily put his head through it. That's the point I'm trying to make here. Now, now look at how prevalent this is. Uh, in other places too. In Lights and Shades of Ireland in 1850, on page 192, we find uh, the giant's grave at Donegal. There is a tomb of the giant's armor bearer on an eminence near, which has been opened and found bones of great size. The lower jawbone was quite perfect and so large that it went with ease over the jaws of the biggest headed laborer present. Now let's flip over to the United States. And this is just, I read this entire history of Kentucky. I swear to God, it was like 1,200 pages long. And I found in this one record of, uh, from the, um, the history of Kentucky, all these different accounts of, of the jawbone fitting over the face. Page 107, these are different dates, you know, from the 18s to the 1900s. A number of bones belonging to a giant race have been taken. Jaw bones which could go over the whole chin of a man and teeth correspondingly large. The teeth remained sound, but the other bones crumbled on exposure to the air. The femur tibia skull and inferior maxillary bones so large when compared with the size of the late John Campbell, himself six foot four inches in length, as to indicate a race seven or eight feet high. John Campbell slipped the jaw bone of one entirely over his own, flesh and all. So these same themes, the, the largest man in town, the jawbone over the face, the specific measurements of giant bones. Page 666, the lower jawbone, when fitted over the lower portion of a man's face in the party of explorers, completely covered it. The thigh bone from the hip bone to the knee was 42 inches long, which is utterly outrageous. And the forearm from the wrist to the elbow, elbow measured 22 inches. This would indicate a giant over 10 feet high. And page 722, oh, I, it's not he, it's the, the underbone, the under jaw bone of one was large enough to fit over uh, the jaw, flesh and all of any common man of the present day. So seeing this, you might say, 
I can't believe this isn't a more well-known story. I can't believe that um, scientists don't really look at it, at least don't mock and deride this idea of giants existing in the past. But, you know, first of all, this is a, a side effect of the research of a number of us, of Andrew, Greg, Hugh, myself, Micah Ewers, Ross Hamilton, and others who have gone through, you know, mountains of documents, uh, talked to survivor, uh, ancestors, gone to museums, on and on and on, to unearth these accounts. Now, if I am, a, you know, your mainstream anthropologist, archaeologist, I don't dig in and find these um, connections. I kind of dismiss the whole thing as like, oh, that's a bunch of, you know, illiterate farmers talking about giant bones they thought they found in the 1800s. They don't piece the whole story together. There isn't a lot of um, encouragement to do that. In fact, when you mentioned these ideas, you, you were you were basically branded a lunatic, um, and that's the that's the name of the game. That the ego takes over. It's it's kind of a really um, closed off paradigm, unfortunately. So I don't believe in a mass conspiracy. That's ridiculous. Where academics are hiding evidence. That 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 is what dry, that's what makes academics even move further away from these controversial ideas. I just believe, um, you know, like I said, that there isn't a lot of um, reason to dig into th to these things, and you have to start with a real passion to unsaw to you know figure out a mystery. So I figure a lot of the people that you hear today, they're just like you know 1970s uh, New York City detectives with 70 tabs open in their computers going through documents, driven and obsessed, and that's just the way it is. And I think a lot of us in the ancient mystery research world are just that type of person. We just feel compelled to to unearth a mystery, and it, we just find it very, very interesting, and intuitively uh, it rings true to us. So Irish pedigrees over back in Ireland, check this out. It is stated by Ware that the uh, sepulchral, that's like a, a burial mound, at Nox, uh, Noxdenan, let's see, Noxadan, near Swords in the county of Dublin, were open in his time, and it was found the remains of a man of gigantic size, the skeleton measuring from the top of the ankle, I'm sorry, the top of the skull to the ankle, eight foot four inches. The bones of the skull were very thick and the teeth of enormous size. The limbs were all very large in proportion, and it appears that this giant, when living, must have been nearly nine feet high. So, once again, buried obscurely in these voluminous documents of town and county histories and genealogies and survey markers are these wild giant accounts, just like in the United States. And one of the skeptics' arguments, um, once again, it's these are mastodon bones, you know, or some large animals, which they're not. I mean, clearly they're like in Patagonia, they found dinosaur bones or Macedon bones and they were misidentified, but this is a different animal. And the other idea is that these are all, um, you know, front page hoaxes to sell newspapers and which is utterly immature and ridiculous. And it is, it's an amalgam of, um, you know, ideas that just don't hold any weight. The, 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 uh, the debunking notions now, I don't have a time machine. I don't know what this means, but as a practical and objective observer of reality, which I like to think I am, all these themes are hit all over the, the world, once again, in the historical documentation that has nothing to do with, with highlighting giants or selling books or anything like that. So yes, there were some front page headlines in the New York Times about giant finds, which may or may not have been true, but there's also so much of this. In fact, the New York Times often would print the Smithsonian's own ethnology reports when there were remarkable finds, like seven foot nine uh, Professor Norris in West Virginia. Uh, that was in the New York Times as well as in the Smithsonian literature. So I'm just, you know, laying out this case because I've heard you can imagine how much heat I've taken just to, you know, lay out this case and be interested in, in um, science and history. Uh, and make shows and write books and stuff like that. And you just catch so much flack. It's, 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 uh, it's really, um, you get lumped in together with, um, you know, the, this, this grouping of, of, of people that really are supposed to be uh, not have the intellectual wherewithal to understand these, these ideas. And that's the only thing idea I really push back against um, because you'll see, you know, some of these people that I work with are utterly brilliant, you know, uh, 
Andrew and and, uh, and Greg and all the speakers you'll see here are well researched and, and uh, very objective. So here's another example <clears throat> of an eight foot five and a half inch skeleton. And oftentimes the, these skeletons were found or associated with megalithic sites. <clears throat> and this holds true in Ireland as well. And uh, beautiful dolmens there. I'm half Irish actually and half uh, Portuguese. My mother grew up in, or, or no, her parents grew up in Cork County. And what's interesting is she had a seven, over seven foot tall cousin she always talked about because he had such enormous strength and he was normal in all other ways, but he was, I think he was like seven foot nine. And he was always known to like, uh, you know, be a hard worker and tireless and, and be able to pick up thousands of pounds. So I want to hit this um, anatomic anomaly as well, a, a polydactyly. This is extra digits, six fingers, six toes, seven fingers, seven, seven toes. And there was yet a battle in Gath where a man of giant stature on every hand, six fingers, every toes, uh, every foot, six toes, 24 in all. So the giant of Gath is talked about from um, having this condition. And also Kukulain, one of the main uh, heroes in Irish mythology, he had seven fingers on each hand and seven toes on each foot, which is interesting. And the giants of Cornwall, the giants of Trend the Mont had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. In Wales, the giant burial at Longman's grave belonged to a man of extraordinary proportions who lived in the, in the area and had six fingers on each hand. An article from the Ulster Medical Journal exploring the hereditary uh, gigantism presents a link between the AIP gene that causes pituitary gigantism and polydactylism, extra digits. So I'll go, this is kind of complex um, um, genetics. I'll just go through here and say that this beetle, Bardi, uh, what is it? <clears throat> Bardi beetle gene syndrome is showing that the characteristics of post-axial axial polydactyly, extra digits, and um, AIP, pituitary gigantism, they're in the same neighborhood genetically. So it's really interesting that these conditions um, are, are right together in the genetic makeup of, of, of humans. So, you know, is, it, is this a clue that there was some uh, interbreeding of giant people with small people. And then this, this race um, passed on some of these genetic traits like six fingers and toes. So we have uh, this idea of the first mention of, of polydactyly back to 2,800 um, tetralogical omens in Summa Ibzu in Assyria. And we find a uh, a child's foot votif with uh, six toes from Sumer in the 26th century. Now, what's being asked is, what am I to do with my child with six toes? So the idea of six fingers and to six toes has always been portrayed as either malevolent or divine, which is interesting. This guy has 27 digits, which is <laughs> pretty wild. Uh, the petroglyph sites all around the United States have giant hands and feet with six fingers and toes, which is very interesting. Utah, newspaper rock, right there, look at six toes, giant footprint. This guy has giant feet. Six fingers, six toes. That's in Utah, East Oklahoma. Um, this is Colorado. See, the, the, the larger foot has six toes. Sedona, Arizona. This is in Utah. The larger foot has six toes. And uh, archaeologists, I've read a, you know, a stack of academic papers about this idea that when you had six fingers and toes, you were revered as a supernatural god. And at Chaco Canyon, we have these giant footprints. I think they're 20 inches with six toes climbing up the wall of Pueblo Benito. Patricia Crown was a researcher who talked about this. And the Maya had the same um, ideas about the supernatural reality of six fingers and toes. Excuse me. And in Texas, you have the same thing. Here's a giant foot with six toes. In fact, this is the National Park Service website. A large foot, often with six toes, is a common symbol depicted in petroglyphs and pictographs. Would you? What do you think this foot can mean? You know, I would say it's part of the, the legend of the giants 
with six fingers and toes. Alton, Illinois, look at the giant foot, has six toes, and the small one has five. Uh, Judical Rock right there, seven toes, just like Kukulkain. So the, the legend of the Cherokees is that uh, at Judical Rock, the giant scratched his seven-fingered hands into that rock. There are places like the Pueblo people in um, the Four Corners area. They have a higher incidence of polydactyly than the average population. In Ecuador, there are villages of people with six fingers and toes. Six fingers are the rule in a village in Spain. So it seems like there was some ancient interaction, if you will. And now we know that people have been in the United States much longer. So there might be in migrational waves. There might be lost lands that I'll talk about at the end here. And here on an isolated Pacific island, a, an anthropologist, I.G. Turbert, visited uh, it in 1949 and wrote The Footprints of Tarawa. And it was stunning. It uh, details the evidence for prehistoric giants and their record of gigantic footprints. At one point, he writes, here, various footprints can clearly be seen in the volcanic stone, some of them so huge as to seem impossible. Most have six toes on each foot. This is in an isolated Pacific island. In fact, all the Pacific islands, like the Cooks, the Australs, uh, Easter Island, Hawaii, I I've found petroglyphs of, of uh, hands and feet that are um, with six fingers and toes in all these places. And right here, you have the giant footprint with six, six toes. One of the elders right here who told them that the giants impressed these figures is standing into the footprint too big to seem uh, to be believed. Over in Australia, the spirit beings, these, these giant guardians are found to have six fingers and six toes as well. New Zealand, uh, on and on and on. You know, I, I could list all the places um, that I found, but... Basically, it'd be quicker to, to list the places I haven't found on the planet that, that um, have this anomaly um, displayed in rock art. So, you know, the big question for people is, you know, are giants a part of uh, normal evolution? No, I'm not anti-evolution, but I also believe that there may have been genetic intervention in the past. I think we might have had advanced races. You have these tales of Samaria where, where uh, humans are created by like this genetic experiment. I am open to these ideas. This is a, a pretty weird universe we live in, and all the ancient traditions talk about this. And frankly, because the gods, you know, Veracocha and other gods were purported to have created the giants and humans. And, you know, it, it sounds like a, a, a child's fairy tale, but that's what is specifically noted by indigenous people and in religious documents that uh, the, the giants along with humans were created in some kind of genetic experiment. So, you know, the idea of a lost land existing in the past has been talked about by many uh, researchers, uh, hypothesized by Robert Schock and Graham Hancock and others. And I guess we'll, we'll look into it right now and, and what the legends say in the British Isles. So Doggerland was a huge area of land it's submerged beneath the Southern North Sea. Uh, around 6,500 to 6,200 BC, it was flooded. And, uh, you know, it was this massive area, I'll show you right here. Uh, check that out. And, you know, we know that there was... Um, because they dredged up artifacts and stuff like that. We know there was civilization there. It could be that this is the origin of, of the megalith builders, one of these lost lands. In Karnak, France, um, the, the beginning of the megalithic culture probably goes back about 6,000 BC, which is a staggeringly old, old age. So is there a lost land that's even further back in time than that? And Dargoland and new archaeological discoveries may reveal that. So there's also the lost land of Lioness um, that is, is a, a strong myth um, in England. And Lioness and the Skillies is solidly associated with the legends of giants through both the, in, its stones and barrows. They are said to have ruled there at the dawn of time and shaped the stones into wondrous configurations. Giants and megaliths lie at the foundations of the Lioness Enigma, which must date back to at least 8,000 B.C., a time of especially heavy flooding around all the islands of Britain. Now, one of the new finds is even today, they just found in Chile, 
uh, the massive area of glass that was made by the Young and Dryas impact event. <coughs> now, Graham Hancock and Randall Carlson of others have talked about this on and on and on. If you're a fan of ancient mysteries, we now have a date. Uh, for this event, the great flood, if you will, the conflagration, um, the cataclysm of 12,800 uh, years ago, roughly, that that destroyed, um, you know, megafauna and, and set back humans uh, quite a bit. So these dates are kind of lining up in the past. Now, we have the records telling us that the Twatha de Danin were these tall, exceptionally tall supernatural beings who showed up after the flood. Um, they came from lost island cities in the Atlantic, Murius, Phalius, Gorius, and Findius. It describes them as having resided in the northern islands of the world, where they were instructed in magical arts before arriving in Ireland. They brought with them advanced weapons, technology, and megalithic construction expertise. They, they taught art and poetry and animal husbandry, just like the, the Shining Ones or the Anunnaki in Samaria or, or Veracocha in Peru. These beings show up after the flood. And, and one um, criticism of ancient mystery research is that somehow it's racistly oriented, that the idea is to um, rob the indigenous people of the creations of, of their people, like in Egypt or Peru. And I say the same story holds true in Ireland and Wales and other places. This is, this is around the world. It's not what did the cultures do? It is who is the founders of these cultures deep in antiquity? And the indigenous people themselves say that there were these strange beings who showed up with advanced technology, oftentimes portrayed as giant. So this is interesting here. Um, we have uh, AIP gene defect in Irish populations in gigantism that stated in Ulster County, this is probably the highest proportion of giants in the whole world in this little part of Northern Ireland. So this gigantism exists in Northern Ireland the place where the Tuatha de Danine landed on Iron Mountain, we have this um, genetic link as if there was this interbreeding and almost a rejection by humans uh, that caused a, a disease condition. That's just a hypothesis by me. But there's no getting around that the highest incidence of uh, gigantism in the world is at the site of where these uh, giant supernatural rulers showed up thousands of years ago. So Charles Byrne was one of these beings. Um, Cornelius McGrath, he was over eight foot tall. There are lots of giants, um, modern day giants that existed through generations. The research went back 2,500 years. Here's Patrick Cotter, he was eight and a half feet tall. Um, here's the Fomorians that showed up. They were the enemy of the Tuatha de Danin. Uh, and this doesn't really portray them as giants. This is like a John Duncan photo, but they were this malevolent zoological nightmare that showed up with giants in their ranks like Baal the giant from a lost world. So there is this mythology that they were these ancient, you know, sea raiders and pirates who had giant people in their ranks and they warred with the, um, the ancient Tuatha de Danin. So Aelian says this uh, to the king of Phrygia and Selenius, Europe, Asia, and Libya are islands washed on the shores by the continent, and there is but one continent which is situated outside these limits. Its expanse is immense. It produced very large animals and people twice as tall as those common to our climate, and they live twice as long. So all these ancient geographers and, and recorders are talking about this, this land in the Atlantic. So before the birth of Plato, Homer described a now lost enchanted land in the Atlantic, which was called Agigia in book uh, five of the Odyssey. He claimed it was the home of the Nymph Calypso and the daughter of the Titan Atlas. Blavatsky also, the, the mystic, talks about it. Edgar Cayce, Rudolf Steiner, I studied the esoteric sources just to see what they say, and they all say the same thing about giants existing, Atlantis existing in the Middle Atlantic. This is what Blavatsky says. Plato's narrative bears the impress of truth upon it. It was not he who invented it at any rate, since Homer, who preceded him by many centuries, also speaks of the Atlantes and one of their islands and of their island in the Odyssey, Agigia. Therefore, the tradition was older than the bard of Ulysses. Uh, Strabo, the Alexandrian uh, geographer, says that Agigia was located in the middle of the Atlantic. 
Plutarch informs us that the Aegean Isle lies far out to sea, distance five days sail from Britain, going westward and three others equally distant from it. So there is a lot of historical corroboration that there was an island nation in the middle of the Atlantic called Hyperborea or High Brazil, Agigia, Atlantis, whatever you want. The traditions clearly state that uh, the founders came from this island nation. And I will say that I spent a lot of time with indigenous people um, doing ceremonies, a lot of wisdom keepers I've talked with. And um, I just find that indigenous culture has a lot more integrity than, frankly, a lot of the Western cultures that we belong to. And I think it's almost a racist uh, orientation to dismiss you, the oral traditions of all these people. They're all saying the same thing, and they're all speaking of lost lands and giants and these strange phenomena of the past that that just uh, get marginalized. So I think you know th- there was some of that kind of arrogance from the academic world as well in the dismissal of oral traditions because they clearly state these things and they tell the same strange and specific story and it's ubiquitous. So um, I hope that was not too much to digest. I want to thank you for uh, having me. Uh, Thank you and Andrew for always having this conference. Uh, To me, this is one of the better conferences or probably the best conference I go to year in and year out. Mostly. Uh, I always find the speakers are really engaging. They're objective. I'm probably the most far out of the speakers there, but I like to, um, you know, share the research because I, a lot of people just say that, you know, these things ring true intuitively. And I think a lot of people are driven to like conspiracies that have no basis in reality by the fact that these uh, controversial subjects that appear to have a basis in reality are not looked at objectively. They're mocked, they're ridiculed. When you engage in them, you are misperceived to be intellectually incapable of understanding them. And I just don't think that is true. Even if you look at Han- Graham Hancock's uh, site on Wikipedia, it says pseudoscientific and all this nonsense, you know, when he's obviously a, a very intelligent and, and thoughtful researcher. You know, the larger point here is I like to engage these controversial subjects and bring them into the middle and hopefully make them available for most people to make up their own mind. Now, uh, in, in Origins is always a great place for that. The crowds are great, and uh, Hugh is always uh, puts on a really good um, conference. So I want to thank you. I urge you to get my book and Hugh's book if you're interested in the subject, and our first book as well. And I think you'll see um, that if you don't think there's a story here, you're almost being disingenuous. That doesn't mean we have the whole story figured out, but... Uh, the uh, there is no such thing as coincidence to the level that we've uncovered in, in these uh, findings. And I, I think you'll enjoy these books if you get them. And uh, Hugh will be speaking next about the souls of thunder. Now, it isn't just a series of, of uh, giant accounts. It, there is more coincidence. There is more almost supernatural events that occur when the opening of these giant graves occurred. And, and Hugh will talk about that. A really fascinating uh, subject. And uh, yeah, I'll wrap it up with that. And and I, I appreciate everybody's uh, attention. And I hope we can convene in uh, person next year. And I hope everybody is well and uh, keep an open mind and take care. And Jim's here now. So, uh, oh, we have a few questions already in the Q&A box. Okay, first one from Matt Chapman. Okay, so... With six fingers on each hand, is there any evidence of a base 12, which is, is correct, the duodecimal system, uh, numerology, as opposed to base 10? Or was it that they were such a small population that they simply used the same base as the majority, Jim? Yeah, I, I gave somewhat of an answer. Um, I typed it out. But I, I've heard that suggested that the, the Anunnaki or the Sumerian gods had six digits on each hand. And thus, that was why their system was based um, or, or created a 12 base system. As far as evidence is concerned, I think you can only uh, speculate. Um, you know, <laughs> okay, he always mocks me for speculating, so <laughs> I'll limit it my speculation. Um, 
but I think it's a very interesting idea. In fact, I think Gilgamesh, I know he had an extra row of teeth, just like Hercules, and was believed and had the statues with him with six fingers, uh, which is very interesting. And he was known to be a giant, um, I think, before the flood, the great flood. Uh, and, you know, the Sumerians kings list, I think it goes back like 140,000 years or maybe even more. Um, um, so you have this this notion that you, these gods, who, wherever they came from or whoever they were, had these uh, divine and supernatural attributes. So it's a very good hypothesis and it's very interesting. And I will say one thing about the Sumerian uh, system, it, it's just uh, mind boggling complex. They, they're deciphering um cuneiform tablets to this day and and figuring out that they understood you know trigonometry with the angle with right angles and and new forms of trigonometry so wherever that uh math came from uh it was a um, a high source excellent that's a that's a decent answer okay so we've got uh <laughs> margaret says thank you jim maria wheatley found that the elongated skull of the stonehenge queen that she examined appears to have two crown chakras Often psychic and or autistic people have a double crown of hair on their heads. Perhaps all this ties in with these giant people having extra meridians. What do you make of that? Uh, it, it's interesting hypothesis. I, um, you know, I, I, I like to keep an open mind. I, I had uh, a mystic tell me that I have a friend with Down syndrome. And uh, she told me that people with Down syndrome have are oftentimes in this benevolent state and it's perceived that like oh they're lost or they're incapable but they're kind of in this feedback loop uh and oftentimes autistic people and people with asperger's they, they just have these capabilities that we can't comprehend and we kind of marginalize them uh, you know i'm a fan of of the mystical realms and the idea that um we have devolved from a much larger state of of uh metaphysical understanding so you know, theories like that are, are perfectly reasonable to, to ask yourselves. And um, so, you know, once again, I can't I can't prove it scientifically, but I can speculate that, um, you know, it's a possibility that's interesting. So, Jim, I've got a message from Carrie here. Have you found any evidence of six digits in Egypt? Uh, let me first uh, kick back to a question a couple uh, times ago. Edgar Casey actually said I'm a big Edgar Casey fan. I study his stuff that the greatest health benefit is to be in the presence of the atmosphere after a lightning strike kind of corroboration with what, what um, Hugh was saying. Yes, I have found evidence. Uh, I, I do an entire um, slideshow PowerPoint on six fingers and six toes and Hugh um, has it as megalithomania site. So the video is there. I show examples in Egypt uh, Kanum, the androgynous god at the Temple of Esna. In fact, I show a close-up of his six-fingered hands. He was uh, he was purported to be a giant and this androgynous god from a lost land. In fact, the Aeneid, all nine androgynous original gods, as listed on the building texts at the Temple of Edfu, are said to be self-fertilizing androgens. Um, that's uh, <laughs> that's that's one of my uh, areas of interest. That all the gods are are purported to be androgynous. But yes, I found many examples in Egypt. There's a couple more questions as well okay. um, from Nick Nick D. Could the name Og or Gog associated with the British giants be linked with the name of a Gigian or, or Gogian Isles related to Strabo, which Jim referenced in his lecture? A absolutely. That that's a great question and. Og is found everywhere. We cover it in the book. Uh, in fact, Edgar Casey once again said that Atlantis was turned into a chain of islands after cataclysm, uh, not only 50,000 years ago, but 28,000 years ago. And then the original sinking, or I mean, the final sinking was the Younger Dryas impact about 12,000 years ago. But one of the islands was called Og, which is interesting. And Agigia that the Greek uh, geographers talk about, and that Homer talked about, uh, absolutely, it, it, it has the same characteristics that the mystics talked about, this lost land in the middle of the Pacific. Um, so that, that's a great question. And I agree that Og is found everywhere. And then uh, Gog and Magog, the um, uh, the king of uh, Og of Bashan in the Bible with the huge bedstand. Uh, there's, you know, myth and legend. On, I'll, I'll tell a quick story. I live in Western Massachusetts. And the native tribes here have the legend in Deerfield, Mass, 
about the petrified beaver. And what it really is, is a correct rendering of the geological record that goes back 13,000 years. And Hitchcock, the um, whose name is applied to Lake Hitchcock, went to meet with the leader of the Pecumtucks in Northampton, Mass. And the elder told him about that. And Hitchcock basically um, said that the, the native people understood the geological record here where I live in Massachusetts back 13,000 years. And a couple of years ago, Harvard archaeologists found an encampment site on the slope of the petrified beaver, Pecumtuck Mountain, that goes back 12,900 years. So it all ties together. So myth and legend, it may sound like a fanciful child's tale, like a giant petrified beaver, but they were portraying the draining of Lake, Hick Lake Hitchcock and the true understanding of the geological record. And they're not gonna write out a spreadsheet. They're gonna tell a story that their wisdom keepers can tell through generations. And that's what we see in the Aboriginal tribes and we see in the British Isles and everywhere else. So don't be put off by left brain, male dominated Western science that portrays that uh, as some kind of ignorant gibberish. That's my rant. <laughs> Oh, we've got Robert Jones has got a question uh, probably for both of us. When gigantic proportion of skeletons are found, anthropologists identify them as living during a time when the Earth's gravity and atmosphere were different. They identify them with a present time ancestor, which is adapted in size and having characteristics more suitable to the present day environment. Would this not give a hint to the presence of the human species at this time of gigantisms and still apart from the human DNA? Um, well, I think we I think we actually talked about that in our last book as well, didn't we, where we were talking about difference in not just gravity, you know, which could be a thing. This is something that um, I've talked to various people about, actually. Um, I talked to Thomas Sheridan. He's done some research on this. He believes that there, there was a case of that. But also we talk about a difference in the amount of oxygen or I think it was slightly like a half a percent more carbon dioxide would trigger this kind of thing. And there was some, there was some analysis done on that by various scientists. And that's why there was like the megafauna, uh, you know, potentially the dinosaurs, that's kind of one of the theories. And some people suggest that that kind of trait managed to stay and it, was, and it stayed in the kind of breeding circles between the elites in very ancient prehistoric times. So there's one, one idea about that at least. Have you got anything else there, Jim? Yeah, I think it. I think Vine Deloria, the the great Native American uh, author, might have talked about that fact about a different atmospheric conditions. You know, once again, we had megafauna, megaflora at the end of the late Pleistocene, twelve to fifteen thousand years ago. Um, I, you know, I am a believer uh, in in cosmic catastrophes. You can have uh, coexisting realities. You can have uniformitarianism, and you can have. Uh, you know, uh, catastrophism existing in the same universe. And I, I believe uh, if you follow H Hancock and Carlson's work, more and more evidence is popping up. Uh, in fact, there's a new study out of Chile, you know, the Atacama Desert covered in glass from the Younger Dryas impact strike, it looks like. Um, so I, I think there was a change in the atmospheric conditions. Uh, David Talbot has this wonderful video about the, the, the different configuration of the planets in the past and how the ancients... Uh, saw them and made their myths around that. And there was a change that kind of brought to a conclusion, the golden age that once existed. And, you know, I, I, a lot of us have this intuitive sense that there's a different story, but we also feel like we've devolved as a species somewhat from a golden age. And that kind of rings true to a lot of people. And, uh, you know, so, so I think that the ideas that we're tapping into, they're archetypes that ring true to a lot of people. So I, I would say in these these matters, you know, kind of follow your intuition and uh, and and decide who it is you hear information from as well, because there's a lot of, uh, you know, people that will, will take a theory and, and run with it with without proper investigation. We've got um, Vicky uh, is talking about people with autism and they have an uncanny ability to retain vast amounts of obscure and detailed data. Yes. Could people with this not have been the first to watch the sky and mapping the stars and record keepers and the tribes of oral cultures? I will say yes. And I will also say that um, there's a wonderful show on PBS called Astrid about an autistic woman who's the head of criminal records in France. And uh, the subtitles in English, I just say what it's such a, a wonderful and beautiful portrayal of people with Asperger's and autism. Uh, that you might want to watch it. You'll be heartened by the show. And probably, uh, I agree that people with autism and Asperger's, uh, 
I, I bet were considered, um, you know, part of an almost supernatural cast in the past. They were revered uh, for their abilities. And now they don't seem to fit into our, uh, you know, mechanized death cult of a society. So they get marginalized. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> okay, and Car Carrie's just uh, continuing from a bit. It's uh, talking about the, uh, the, the 12 fingers, uh, six 12 fingers. And she asked a question because the vision of the zodiac into 12 signs is beautiful symmetry, is more easily divided than a 10 house zodiac system. Mm -hmm. And she thinks possibly six digits times two on hands and feet can relate to the creation of the 12 house system. So, yeah, I just wanted to follow that up. And, and that, that's possible, but you, that's divided. Like I think it's twenty one hundred and sixty years per per house. I think that's a that's astronomical uh, fixed um, mathematical figures, not uh, contingent on the uh, polydactyly of a particular race. But I'm open to any ideas like this as well. But yeah, I think that's pretty much all the questions. Mm -hmm.